Hello everyone and welcome back to my continuing Amiga 500 Resurrection adventure as we take this uh, Amiga 500 that I've had uh, stored for about what the last 25 or so years and bring it back to full operation. This was the one that I had in the last video for the power supply repair. It made sort of a cameo appearance and videos up here. Uh, now we're going to actually dig into this Amiga basically as found as it sat. So let's get started. Now I'll now just remove the keyboard. And this is what we got. I'll start off with the RAM expansion in the trap door here. We could see that this is, uh, I, I don't recall how much memory is in this RAM expansion. Uh, we're gonna find out when I turn this on shortly. Uh, moving up to the uh, baseboard here. We can see this also has a real time clock. I have just pulled this battery now, uh, a CR2450. So now I can see that. And the battery hasn't leaked or anything. So everything is absolutely fine here. And then I have here a Mega Midget Racer. And this is an accelerator card, and this sat right on top of the original 68,000 processor. And there is no 68,000 processor on this computer. I, I guess originally the intent was to put that original processor back in here. Never did that, right? So um, this is the processor now. I think this is an 030. Yeah, this is a 68030 that's running in this computer now. And I believe this is a 25 megahertz accelerator. As luck would have it, I have a shipment of discs and amongst them are, are a couple of versions of uh, early workbench. So we'll be able to fire this thing up and have a look. Now I want to tell you how I'm doing video because in the power supply video, I, did, I really didn't show the output of this because it was just connected via the monochrome cable to the Commodore 64 monitor. It wasn't really a whole lot to see. I'm coming out of the video interface and I have one of these cables and this was by recommendation of some people in the group as, as a scenario to try. And this DB cable breaks off into video and audio, uh, the audio going into the RCA jacks, and the video is SCART. And the SCART is going into this, into this box right here. You see, I actually uh, uh, picked this up, this SCART cable from England. So basically what we have is SCART to RGB cable, right? And it is in turn going into this uh, HDMI converter box, coming out of this box, HDMI, and into my computer monitor. We found out that this actually works surprisingly well. We're gonna turn this on first, right? So I'm gonna turn on the Commodore power supply, just so we could take a look, right? And, and it's analog, right? We're, we're gonna get really close once Workbench boots up, right? Let me bring this up just a tad. And now I'm gonna put in the boot disk. baseboard boot and install disk. I'm just going to open up a folder so we can get really close and, and take a look at what, what fonts look like and whatnot. Just going to open up a couple things. Get the camera right up on the screen. See aspect ratio adjusted perfectly uh, for this device. There we go. I think, I think that's a good mixture. And here we are. I, I've got the camera right up to the screen. Uh, just to give you an idea of how sharp this is. And obviously, you, you can't, you know, there's a, a, you know, a blur at the pixels. This is analog after all. But there is n almost no noise. The ca I don't think the camera could capture the sort of, that, that snowdrift effect that you get kind of noise. But it is so unbelievably subtle. It could only be seen on a, a perfect single color backdrop like we're seeing here, right? So everything everything is working just fine for this unit. In an effort to prove out the video quality, uh, I also came across a, uh, a viewer program, IFF, and uh, got a couple of uh, what are they, model shots, uh, 320 by 400, and transferred it over, something I'll get into in just a bit. And I'm able to demonstrate that, so I'll click on one so we can see how it looks on the screen is a pretty good demonstration because it's supposed to be like picture quality back then. 
and that's pretty good. And and just by looking at it, you can see that the aspect is correct because it's it's not deformed. You try not to get too excited because I think she would be like 70 years old now based on when it was taken. So I'm just going to uh, zoom in really close so we can see uh, the quality, the pixel quality. And so this is about as close as I could get my gimbal to the screen over the desk. And yeah, so this is camera right in front of the screen. And this is how sharp it looks. So I'm very happy with this setup. I'm going to move on now. I think I've covered uh, RGB to HDMI in enough depth. No pun intended. But once we get out of this program on this floppy disk, we're, we're still left with this, um, you know, one single boot and install disk. And there's no network connectivity uh, to this Amiga. And I'm kind of left with a single floppy drive and that's it. So the question is, uh, given this minimalist configuration, how do I get stuff onto floppy disks? And obviously um, it goes without saying you need floppy disks. So I have, uh, you know, uh, double-sided, double-density disks, blank disks to work with. Uh, so that's not a problem. And the, obviously the drive works. So what do you got to do? So we're going to talk about that. Now I'm aware that there are much better methods to move uh, ADF files into an Amiga than what I'm about to show. But this is for people who find their Amiga, they have all the original equipment, they have floppy disks, they have serial cables from back in the day. And they don't want to make a substantial hardware investment just to try out some software that they downloaded. So this is how to get it going in a minimalist level. That's what this is. So I, I, I realize this. So don't comment that there are other alternatives. I'm well aware of them. The answer, of course, is Linux. Not Not... Not this version, of course. I just wanted to show you period correct box. But Linux, that's how we're going to do this. And the long story short is we're simply going to use the serial port to transfer information from Linux into this computer, copying it uh, to RAM or the disk drive. Now, Apple actually has a program for this. It makes it really easy. And if you don't have the program, Apple doesn't require an operating system. So all you really need to do is install this program as an MP3 through your cassette port or actually type in a small series of hexadecimal uh, values and then you've actually created an over the serial bootloader to have this installed relatively quickly. This is very convenient. The Amiga's not that far off. I use a USB to serial converter. Uh, I have a whole bunch of different uh, cables, connectors, and whatnot that I'm able to set it up like this. The black box is a null modem interface, so I could run one computer to another without having a rollover cable. The first thing you want to get is the Transwarp Auto Decompressing file, and that can be found at this URL shown here. I will include it in the description below. Next, you want to go to this link to get a copy of the latest version of Ombre. Uh, once you get that zip file, you can extract the ADF file so we can use it later. First thing I'm going to do is check the serial port and make sure that I know what interface my uh, USB serial is on, right? And we can see right here that I'm connected to our TTY USB 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to issue the following command to set up the serial to the exact specifications as required to do the first procedure. And this is command right here. I'll include it in the description below. And I hit enter. And that command is now done. So what I want to do now is set up the file for sending. But I'm not going to send it yet. I just want to set it up, right? So wherever you had downloaded it to, right? So we're going to cat it, the file, directed to TTY USB 0. We're not going to hit the enter key yet. We're not ready to send it yet. On the Amiga, load up Workbench, open up the uh, prefs folder, and click on serial or double click on serial. Want to make sure that the uh, board rate is 9600, uh, buffer size 16,000 or large buffer size and the handshaking is RTS, CTS. That's what we're looking for. Uh, also, if you're going to be saving this, which you don't have to save, you could just do OK, you could just, just do use. Uh, but if you're going to save it, you have to make sure the disk is not write protected. I generally leave my workbench disk write protected. Then we'll be opening up the shell and we want to copy whatever is coming in through the serial port uh, into the RAM disk and assign it a name. So we already know what the name is, so we're going to type in the following command. So it's type is the command. Type from serial to uh, the RAM disk and the file name will be transwarp.run. 
and now the Amiga will sit idly and wait for that file to be sent. Now from within Linux, on that previous command, I'll hit enter. Once the prompt comes back, we could see here, we'll be switching back over to the Amiga. In order to continue this properly on the Amiga, once we got the prompt back on Linux, we're gonna be hitting Control C, just like that. And then we're gonna go back to Linux again. Then what we're supposed to do is send the file one more time so that the Amiga recognizes to stop receiving the file. And we could see by sending the file the second time that there are the two asterisks and the break. And that shows that the transmission of this file was successful. Now let's take a look at the contents of the RAM drive. The transport file is in the RAM drive. The file transfer was successful. We could then execute this program, which will uncompact the needed files and put it onto the boot disk that will allow uh, the minimum requirements needed to pull and build ADF images onto diskettes on the Amiga. It says that the archive is corrupt, but that's perfectly okay. It's because of that dummy file. If it shows what you're seeing on the screen, everything ran just fine. So now I type a new STTY command into Linux, just like that. And I will be rerunning the cat command just like before, except with the uh, ombre ADF file. Of course, you have to specify uh, if you are NTSC or PAL. I will wait here at this point and not hit enter. In the Amiga, I will invoke a command for transwarp and type in the arguments that are required to uh, pull the ADF image and build it onto a disk. You'll have to make sure that the floppy disk is formatted first. And there's a command that I'll be using for transwarp. And I'm going to hit enter. And this should prompt me to insert a floppy disk in the drive that's formatted. If I pull out the boot disk, and I will put in the floppy disk. I'll give it a second, and then once it's ready, I'm going to hit enter. This disc has the right protection on, so I will turn off the right protection, I'll put it back in. And I'll hit enter. And now it's waiting here at track zero. I'm going to have to go back to Linux again. At this point in Linux, as it's waiting for the ADF, it is now safe to hit enter. If we look at the Amiga, we could see that the drive is active and the tracks are incrementing. This is going to happen uh, for 80 tracks, so it takes quite a while. Once this is finished, after a very long time, you'll be prompted to hit Q for quit. It closes the serial device. Now. Because we burned this image onto that disk and it is a bootable disk, um, ombre, we can uh, hit the two Amiga keys and control and reboot the computer with that disk. It's like its own distro of taking ADF files and making uh, disks out of them. Once I have it set up in Ombre, I could kick it up a notch. I'll set up the uh, serial device for 19.2, and that will make the uh, ADF transfer significantly quicker. So I'll just type in this command. Any subsequent sending of ADF files after this will basically be anytime I connect to Linux, I'll be setting this command to set up the serial interface for 19.2, and then the cat command with the name of the ADF file the greater than sign, and then the uh, dev TTY USB zero. That process will happen over and over again on the Linux side. On the Amiga, you want to go for the first time to system preferences. We don't really care about uh, the mouse. We just want to click on serial. And what we want is we want it on 19.2. So we can see 19.2 is set up, but we want to make sure that the buffer is 16384. So we have the maximum buffer. Everything else here looks correct. So I click use. And because we just burned this image, the disk would not be copy protected. So we could hit save. That way we don't have to go and do this again. Now Ombre should be set up for use. All we would have to do is do what I had just described on the Linux side. 
and then go and click on serial and receive EDF via serial over here, right? There's also some other uh, functions in Ombre that are useful, such as formatting a floppy disk, which obviously would be required in order to use that disk to put the image on. In order to demonstrate how Ombre works, I'm just going to use the very same ADF file and just use Ombre to pull it back, but at 19.2, which would be significantly quicker. So obviously I'm using the same disk I'm booting with, which has an inherent dangers, but I realize that this is just for an example, so it's okay. So I'm going to receive ADF via serial. And we can see that it built out the command down here. And now it's saying insert the disk, which we're going to use to do this, and hit return. Now generally I'd be putting in a blank floppy disk, but I'm going to be using the actual ombre disk to do this. So I'm going to hit return now. And now it's waiting for the data. I'm going to go over to Linux, and I'm basically going to invoke the exact same command I did last time, except... We're running at 19.2. And by sending that command, we can see that uh, Ombre has already started, although it is running significantly quicker now because of the board rate. And it's able to use a, uh, a different serial driver, the uh, ArtSer device, uh, and that's what allows it to run faster. So when this is done, I'm, I'm going to end up with the same disk I started with, but it does demonstrate at this point uh, how ADFs are moved across uh, using this uh, Ombre disk. And this program ends the process the very same way. It's very painless, very easy to use. I hope you found this useful to get your bare metal Amiga turned up, uh, covered the video to a uh, modern flat screen monitor, and the ability to get ADF files copied over to floppy disks. So I'll leave you with this. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe today. Thanks for watching.